Hello, and welcome back to another episode of International Immersion, a podcast that seeks to capture the combined experiences of people, culture, places, traveling, current events, living abroad, and everything that comes along with them. For today's episode, we have one of my old friends that I used to, uh, that I knew when I was in college, and who has up till now had a very interesting career and some very interesting uh, changes in her career that have really, I think, really makes her stand out in a number of ways. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend, and uh, it's great to have you on today and just catching up with you lately. It's, it's amazing to see some of the things that you've accomplished and just kind of the journey you've gone through in your life so far. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me here. Um, well, um, definitely it's a good time to catch up with you. It's been way overdue, and I'm very excited for your show and then be on your show. Oh, well, I'm one, glad to hear that. And I'm really ex- It's great to catch up with you. I know it's been quite a while. And uh, like I said, just kind of reminiscing on some of the things you've done from catching up with you. It's really incredible. So, you know, I think it's really interesting in that what you've been able to accomplish in your life so far, and also where you started off to where you are now and all the twists and turns, I think it's really inspiring. Okay. And it shows what someone can accomplish if they put their mind to things and also just the myriad of experiences and settings that you've been involved with. I mean, some of the stuff we'll go into that just really like, you know, you never think someone, oh, you work in this place or you've done that. So to begin with, maybe you could start off with a little bit of your background and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, of course. So I was born and raised in China in a town called Tianjin, China, very close to Beijing. It's about probably half hour train ride, but most people don't know about us. Um, I moved here when I was 15 years old after finishing middle school and I came for high school. And the reason for it, because my father has been living in the US for quite some time at that time. Went to a couple of different high schools and then eventually graduated from Belleville East in Illinois. Went proceed to college and then that's where we met, Southern Illinois, Edwardsville. Mm-hmm. Great school. Seems like a long time ago already. It is, it is a long time, long time ago. And I pick a very safe major. I, my first major undergrad was accounting. And the second major was international business. And then the reason I pick accounting because my mom was an accounting professor back in China. And it seems like, oh, it seems like easy enough for me. I can crack this. <laughs> and I just kind of went on with it, right? Well, and, and also the fact that, you know, everyone is, going to need accountants they're never going to go out of style you know they all people need bookkeepers so it's a very safe major i mean kind of dry and, and like you know, like you mentioned it, you need a certain temper temper mentality to, to do it you know well but it's still a very useful major maybe just not absolutely. interesting to many others absolutely it was a very safe major it's a very uh asian personnel oriented major right i would say um after graduation, I decided to go for my master right away. And uh, I did my MBA at the same school um, because I know myself, if I need to do it, I need to do it now. It'll be harder for me to go back to a school once I start working. Oh, that's so and, true. You, yeah, it's like, you know, sometimes depending on the major, it may be better to get some experience to come back. But once you leave school and start working, when you come back, you realize how difficult it is because trying to work a full-time job and do a program, it's, it's very challenging. Absolutely. I can't agree more to that. Absolutely. I mean, kudos for the people they actually do on their master while they're working full time. So I knew some people do that, like kudos to them. But I knew I wasn't one of those people. So I had to get it done right away. Um, I was really lucky for the sense that after I graduated, I had the opportunity to move to Phoenix. And at the time, I think I kind of use excuses with my mom. It's like, oh, I'm studying for my CPA. I need a couple months off. I'm studying for my CPA, so I'm not going to find a job right away. And of course, a couple months in, my mom was like, uh, how's that CPA test going? I'm like, eh, it's going, right? Then I started really kind of persuade her that like maybe I should go for a PhD. And then at the time, my mom asked me, like, oh, is it the job market must be tough, right? Like, okay, yeah, I'm supporting PhD as, as every Asian mom would support more education. 
And uh, that, unfortunately, so, that stereotype is very true. Very true. Very, shoes, very right true. It's like, I don't care what you do. You can not even know how to tie your shoes, but more degrees, the better. So, you know, finally, she asked me the question and I said, you know, that's not really the job market is really not bad right now. And the accountants, oh, they can always find a job. However, I just love traveling. And I know when I'm in school, I have summer vacation, I can go travel. So, of course, that didn't sell her the PhD program. So me and my mom had an agreement. She said, I will let you go travel because at the time I really want to go backpacking in Southeast Asia. She was like, I'll let you go backpacking in Southeast Asia. I'll support you for that. But after that, you have to come back and find a job. Uh, so, the classic compromise. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I know some, some of my friends, they have parents that are pretty strict. It, it, it varies, but yeah, it's like, okay, you, the give and take, you know, appeasing versus what you want to do. I mean, there's so many factors, especially some of my, my other Chinese friends. I mean, they're, I feel bad for them because you know, they're really intelligent. They do a lot, but they're under so much pressure from their parents. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, the deal was made. So there I go, I pack a backpack and then I went to travel to Southeast Asia for three months, meet up with a couple of people along the way, some of my friends, old friends, and meet another new friends through the hostel. And I love, generally I love traveling backpack, back, backpacking style. So after I came back, as, as the deal was made, I need to find a job. And then one of my biggest thing while I was looking for a job is I want to work for a Fortune 500 company. That was my ultimate goal. That's a very lofty goal and a great goal to set. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Like I think uh, that was like my main focus. I want to work for a Fortune 500 company and I didn't really have any or any anything like it has to be this industry or it has to be this company, but just a Fortune 500 company. And I also know I don't want to do anything with accounting because it doesn't fit my personality. And I think I have a hard time sitting in an office all day. Yeah. And luckily. From what I know of you, I can, I can certainly, uh, certainly uh, uh, subscribe to that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll take it as a compliment. Oh, no. It's, uh, as it's always. Great. It just, yeah. Like you said, it's a great fallback and it's a great skill to have, but yeah, it definitely, you know, depending on if you're more of an eccentric and more outgoing personality, it can be a little dull. Yeah. So I was very lucky that I find a job with Coca-Cola refreshment at the time and later on become Swire Coca-Cola. Um, I was lucky enough to find a job with them. And then I did marketing with them. Eventually, my title was marketing activation managers for Arizona and New Mexico. So I did a lot of special events. I did a lot of cross-channel marketing between food service on-premises, like your typical, you know, Phoenix Suns, Cardinals, casinos, um, water parks, and then cross-channel marketing to like big stores like Walmart, Fry's, or small store like Quick Trip. So I did a lot of marketing for those, and I really enjoyed it for um, two and a half years total. And... After two and a half years, I really wanted to do something else. Of course, again, right? Like, I'm like, oh, I, I'm ready for something else. So Yeah, you've got in, you got in there. You've, you've tried it out. You've learned a lot, but you're ready, for, you're, you're ready for something new, you know, something to test you again. Absolutely. And then for me, the biggest thing I'm looking for a job is challenging. Like, I want to be challenged. And otherwise, I kind of tend to get a little bored. So, of, of course, with my mom being one of my best friends, like, talk to her, hey, mom, I'm thinking to quit my job and maybe travel the world. And I can never forget the time I told her I want to quit Coca-Cola. And then the comment she made, she said, oh, boy, oh why? Boy. Why can't you just be normal? <laughs> like, I oh. So I think my personality compared to a typical Asian person or Chinese person per se, like especially a female is I'm the black sheep, right? So she's like, I, you know, I'm about to retire from the school. I worked for 30 years. Why can't you, you have a great job, good company, make good money. Why can't you just stick to it? Like retire from it, right? And then that wasn't what something I was looking for. Well, so, I think that kind of shows, you know, the, the different mentalities between you and your mother. Absolutely. A lot of, a lot of people, not just parent child dynamics, a lot of people, everyone's just different. Yeah. I mean, it's great to have a job that gives you the security and benefit and benefits for long, you know, over the long term. but you know, it just, 
yeah, it's like, you don't feel like you're really living life to the fullest. You know, it's just, it, some people are perfectly fine with that. Do they nine to five job? They're perfectly content, but other people, like I know both you and myself were much more go-getters and we prefer to actually explore and may take some risks from time to time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's also one of the biggest things why I love backpacking so much is because there's always risk involved and there's always so many uncertainties and I thrive in situations like that. So I really love that. And then, um, of course, after a long discussion, right. And of course, take- um, I, um, we can do this, yeah. we can do that. I have a plan. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not being crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then, so I think my comeback comments to my mom at a time is what is normal, right? I'm not telling you I want to go rob a bank or murder someone for that. I think it's very abnormal. I probably need help, but that's not what I'm telling you. <laughs> but I will say that was a good retort to your mother. Like what is normal? Yes. Everyone, yes, yes. Everyone has a different view of normal. If you go from country to country, place to place, town to town, person Absolutely. to person. Absolutely. So I said, yes, people normally find a steady job, have a kids, get married. That's the norm. However, it's not normal right? It's the norm, but it's not normal. So take a little bit. And then I, again, I consider myself very fortunate. I had a couple of mentors along the way, um, talked to one of my old mentors and I got a job to do procurement with Boeing in Arizona. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. So I did procurement for capital equipment for a little bit. Then I did mostly uh, help it's more like a middleman position between Boeing and our third party procurement um, called Genpack in India. So I helped manage the relationship with them for a little bit. Eventually, my last position, I got a promotion to be a procurement analyst and then in, help in charging portion of the system, system, system implementation. Hey, for, promotion's always nice. And that, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And then I had, you know, I had, a blast over there um meet some really cool people co-workers in different background i work with and then i had a really awesome boss that really kind of showed me the way always supported my decision and you know overall it's a totally different function of the business and different than marketing different than finance and accounting and i really enjoyed it um during that time right before i started actually so me being me, I like to travel. So I plan my vacations and everything. And right before I started at Boeing, I went to Antarctica. Now that's I didn't atypical. Know. I mean, you hear people going places, but not Antarctica. Yes, Antarctica, because I've been traveled pretty extensively in Europe and Asia. So I was like, you know, it's just a thought, like, I wonder if we can go check out Antarctica if you're not, you know, work for those military base or government. And then sure enough, you can. And then, you know, uh, it's a little difficult to get there, but you can. And then I went on an expedition cruise with this company, this very, very wonderful company called Quark Expedition. And they're actually the first company that started doing expedition cruise to Antarctica. And when there, loved it just fall in love I just love the landscape I love the people the team the expedition team I love the you know the wildlife there the penguins the seal the whale how close they are they're not afraid of humans just it's really just a last piece of land that we reserve on this world right um then what what part what part of Antarctica did you visit on this first trip so the first trip is the it's called the discover the seventh continent so it's the antarctica peninsula ah okay the one that jets up. okay yeah okay that yeah sense. and uh, i just loved it and uh, of course me being me and i was like oh this is such a cool job i would love to work here how can i work here what do i need to do right and because I think you're foreshadowing foreshadowing what's going to happen next yeah and yes i am um just a little background on the cruise. It's not like the Antarctica expedition cruise. It's not like your normal cruise, massive, lot of people. It's a very intimate a cruise that carry less than normally less than 200 people due to the international law. 
And then everybody is an expedition guide. You have an expedition leader. You go hike, you go climb the mountains. You can go kayaking, pedal board, you know, go camping out there. Um, everybody also have an area of specialties. Like we have marine biologists on the ship. We have geologists on the ship, glaciologists, right? People that study birds, people that study Antarctica laws, like, and then they're all coming from really very diverse background. And then they're awesome. Like they, you know, it's very highly high profile team, I would say. And then of course, uh, the expedition leader at the time told me like, well, you know, your, your degree is really not environmentally related. So you kind of, the only way you can get on the team is using your Chinese background as a linguist doing simultaneous translation. I'm like, okay, I can okay, do that. There's an in right there. And not to mention, it must have been a very interesting environment, as you mentioned on that, on the expedition. Absolutely. You had so many different types of people with different backgrounds from different places. I'm sure that it was, there was never a dull moment. Never. And then it's never, even you go on the same trip and then even the exactly same route, you never see the same thing. Just because it's so much uncertainty, you really depends on mother nature. It depends on the wind. The wind can push the icebergs. There's just a lot to, um, to counter for. And then, uh, you know, of course, to work there, you have to learn how to drive a Zodiac. It's a little power boat. And, you know, you have to learn how to firefight for on the ship because the number one threat for a ship is fire and they're just like little tasks right like kind of I, I say it's a little random but unique um skills you need to have um I kept in touch I they I think at the time a lot of people when they go there they always ask oh this is a cool job how can I work here and then normally people don't follow up right because it's, it's it sounds crazy it's I'm going to this no man's land and it's a seasonal job and I have a good job at home right and that yeah, really stuck one of those with things me. where it sounds amazing on paper but when you actually when they actually look into it and what it curtails and the lip and everything that's when it gets like oh a little scary or intimidating whereas you absolutely you, you that you got through that I, it, it was not an easy journey, but it took me two and a half years. Oh, wow. um, I, I interviewed the first years. They, they said they possibly had one position and then they didn't. And then the second year I followed through and then did three rounds of interviews. Um, and then I actually find out it's actually quite challenging to do simultaneous translations because I was a major in that even I speak Mandarin Chinese and but doing a simultaneous translation actually is quite hard very technical you know you need to know how much to translate and when to stop lesson and then translate when to stop translate like it's just a lot of technique technical stuff going into it and you know and after I'm, and I'm studying Chinese myself that would I can imagine is very mentally draining because when yes you, when you're thinking in a second language or using it, it you're using it, 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 it. For me, it definitely wears me out faster than just talking in English because you you can just feel your brain working harder. Yes, absolutely. I agree. And, um, you know, after the second year, I fell through two and a half years. And then finally, I got offered to go there for two trips. That, and then that the both trips were discovered the southern continent it was absolutely amazing there were nothing alike and then but I knew I made a I made a promise to myself if I can get the Antarctica job that will be the time I depart with Boeing I see which so, that's what I did I see so you see you worked for two and a half years and how long did you work at Boeing before you took this job uh two and a half years Okay, so two and a half, two and a half, and then mm -hmm. you took this job in Antarctica after two and a half years of, tr of trying to get, of getting in, and you finally got in. Yep. So it was, it was just like amazing time. It really is amazing time. Um, last year, we couldn't really go due to COVID, right? Um, but this year, hopefully, if the borders open, that I can go back to Antarctica. And I'm looking forward. I have a couple of trips that is awarded to me with ten contingencies for border opening, but I'm really looking forward to go back to Antarctica this year. Um, so again, kind of have to backtrack just slightly a little bit. So while I was at Coca-Cola, I met this wonderful person. It's a great, great friend of mine named Lily. And she was actually an expat 
from China. So she's in the fast track program with Swire Coca Cola from Hong Kong, and then they sent her to U.S. to observe in U.S. market for three years.、Hmm. When I met her, she also had a dream of being、um, learn how to fly, and then she had took some fly lessons in Australia, and then you know, of course, Arizona is a prime fly training state because we're sunny all the time. So she was talking to me about it, and then. I just remember college time. I love like just, you know, doing skydiving stuff like that. And then my mom used to joke around like, "Oh, are you gonna try to learn how to fly one day?" As a joke, because in China there's impossible to learn how to fly. And then of course I told her I was like, "Oh yeah, I I thought about it. I'm totally gonna try it one day." And when I met my friend Lily, I actually clicked with her on fly training. I guess so. If you don't mind, why do you say it's almost impossible to learn to fly in China? So in China, normally all the pilots are pre-selected. They're going through、mm. a selection process with with each airlines, and then they have their own cadet program. So they go to those university that specialize in,、um, you know, fly training. So it's kind of I think it's very similar. They go to university very similar to like Amarillo, and then after they study enough. And then the last two years, or last year, they normally send them to U.S. in different areas of U.S. They partner up with like North Dakota University or sometimes Phoenix. There's just a lot of areas, and then they finish their fly physical fly training. Then they send back. They they get go back to China. Then work for the airline they sign up for, and it's government sponsored program. They Government pays their training, their room and board, and everything. So you can't just say, "Oh, I want to be a pilot one day, and、uh, I'm gonna learn how to fly." It doesn't work like that. And of course, all the airspace are controlled by the government, so you can't just go. We call them. You can't just really go buzz around, right? <laughs> so it's it's more more of a controlled market, and it's、Absolutely. more difficult to get in. Whereas in the U.S., I mean, I'm not a Not an expert on on, on fl- learning to fly or anything, but I know there's private and commercial avenues you can follow, and almost anyone, if they have the time and money and patience, can potentially become a pilot. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, now, yeah, so that sense. so that's when、um, me and my friend Lily clicked on, and、uh, of course she was constantly pursuing, and she f- actually found our first flight instructor, my first flight instructor, which is her flight instructor in. Through her entire flight training, and she really buckled it down for three years while working full time and finish her flight training from zero to hero, from not knowing how to fly to all the way to flight instructor and the multi engine multi engine flight instructor. And at the time, I took it. At the time, I took it more like a hobby as myself. So,、um, you know, working full time, I'll fly when I can.、Um, really, just kind of. Like a hobby versus she's really buckling down at the time, and two year passed. You know that's when I finally got an Antarctica job, and then that's the time. A couple months before that, I met this wonderful, wonderful gentleman. That's my boyfriend now. <laughs> um, he is originally from Finland, and he is a professional pilot. Um, we met, and we are start dating, and then he, he knows my career. At, Aspirations to Antarctica, and then he really thought about something that I was never thought about it. None of my family and friends thought about it, or even just we were just so blind to an opportunity. So he asked me, like, "What are you going to do when you are not in Antarctica?" Right? And I was like, "Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe I'll travel around. I haven't quite figured out." As most of people know, Antarctica job is very seasonal. We go there during the summertime. The、Absolutely、full season five months. Can't imagine working down there in the winter because the Antarctic summer by itself is rather cold. The winter, I mean, yeah, oh my lord. Yes, and then our company also do Arctic expedition. However, Arctic expedition is even more compatible to get in, and I'm not currently working in the Arctic. And so my boyfriend said, "Well, have you actually thought about to become a professional pilot?" You already love it. You already started training. You just wasn't training consistently, doing work. You know, you could have think about it. You can extend to be a hobby all the way to professional. The job, the job market is really good right now. The hour is pretty flexible, really fit in your lifestyle, and then you don't have to give up Antarctica. And I, 
I it's a light bulb went off, right? It's uh, like, oh it's my goodness. The moment you say, oh, this sounds like a win-win situation. I can yeah, keep my, Antarctic, yes. my job in the Antarctic, but I can also yes. do this during the, during the months I'm back, you know, stateside. Yes, absolutely. And that, I think that was like the last draw for me. And I was like, oh, absolutely. And of course, I moved to Dallas during that time after coming back from Antarctica and quit Boeing. And that's where he was stationed at the time. We go there. I start my flight training there. And then just two weeks in, COVID happened. Everything shut down. Oh, so you just get there, you start it, and then bam, COVID hits. Right, COVID hit. Yeah, COVID hit. And then, um, so, you know, he also was like staying at home because there was not a lot of flying going on. So he was also like staying at home. And then what we did is he eventually took over my flight training when um, during the COVID time, we find a flying club and he took over my flight training from pretty much pre solo to all the way to like commercial level. And he became my flight instructor. And I finished my flight training as a flight instructor with um, a bigger flight school because it's a one month accelerated course. Oh, yeah, that 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 worked out perfectly. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, first and foremost is your boyfriend, but hey, that's great. <laughs> he helped you finish your flight training, and now you're a certified, uh, you know, you know, flight instructor. That's that's awesome. Yeah, that's thank you, thank awesome. you. Yeah, it's a lot of hard work and uh, a lot of guidance from him. A lot of sweat in the summer, a lot of tears. Um, but there's times where we're try to rip each other's head off, but then you know we. We didn't break up and then we finished the training. I have just about 500 hours now. So it works. It, it really did work well for us. No, that's, that's great to hear. And it's, it's wonderful how you guys persevered through that, got to the challenges because unfortunately with COVID, it's, it's broken up so many people, groups, friends, you know, et cetera. So, you know, it's, a, it's really a test of endurance and persistence. Yeah, absolutely. Like couldn't, I just, I knew I, I couldn't done it without his help, his guidance and his patience. And yeah, so for sure, we're definitely lucky. And then after our flight training last year, the end of last year, we have agreed to purchase an RV and then traveling the U.S. full time after my flight training. So currently we've been living in our RV since January this year, full time. And then, and then we've been just, you know, just, we just start traveling the U.S. just about now. That's awesome. I mean, it basically, you know, you're, yeah, you're mobile, can go anywhere you want. You have a place to say you're not, you're not grounded or anything. So that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, like I'm. Um, I think we're really lucky, and then to have these opportunities, and then and to he's going back to work, and I'm going back to work. Then, you know, we'll we'll go from there. But yeah, like I I would have to say, like personally, I'm very fortunate with a lot of people in my life that really guide guide me through a lot of difficulties, like um certain difficult decisions, and really kind of shine some lights through my my lifetime so far so no and i think with decisions it's like at the end of the day you have to make the decisions for the right reasons for yourself but you definitely should value the opinions and thoughts of those around around you don't let them rule your thoughts or decisions because that's very unhealthy but they're definitely important and they give you a different point of view on what you're thinking about you know like your mother for example you know her points of view are valid but at the same time they're not you but it's still good to listen to her because you get a different person's perspective on something Absolutely. I think my mother is a very traditional Chinese and very traditional Asian mentality. And I'm really fortunate with her as well. Now I can talk to her about just just about anything. And she has really accepted the my dream, right? Like, and my dream might not necessarily be hers. However, she's very supportive of what I'm doing now. And, and that's I think matters. that's and that's all it yes. matters is yes. that she accepts it, appreciates it, and, you know, gives you her, you know, her, uh, no, I shouldn't say permission, but her, you know, her goodwill for that. Absolutely. And then 
it i think we all have dreams like all of us have dreams whether it's a dream from since we're a child or when we go to college we all have dreams however i think it just when we become adult and then go to work get married have a kid a lot of times we don't like the uncertainties we don't like the change which is just human nature Mm -hmm. however that's when we stop chasing the dreams we had yeah we you get too i'd say people get too comfortable and too complacent you know and not, not and not being negative or trying to sound negative but yes it's you know yeah, I think the more, the more, the more, the older we get, the more settled we get, the more obligations we, we get handed to us, you know, work, family, et cetera. It's just, you know, you can still dream and everything, but it's harder because you have absolutely abilities. So, and that's also a decision a lot of people have to make is like, you know, because, you know, a lot of people these days, there's, they, their, their mentality can range, can range so widely, you know, about kids getting married, absolutely. Do, what type of job, et cetera. So you just have to kind of, look in, look into yourself to see what you really want and what is fulfilling for you as a person and not for absolutely and not for what you think others want you to do or what society thinks you should do i mean society absolutely society but you're not bound to what society expects or the expectations yeah. set by it it really is kind of go back to what is normal right and i just just recently having a conversation with my mom um she really pointed out a couple of things that I really appreciate it. She told me that is, you know, go chase your dream, live your life. But however, there are a couple of operating rules, right? The first one is the dream you're chasing, the things you want to do, it has to bring you joy. Oh, that is so true. I mean, you don't want to do anything that you don't enjoy or you don't gain happiness or, or fulfillment out of because otherwise you're living kind of a hollow life. Absolutely. Like you don't want to chase your dreams for the wrong reason, whether it's money, whether it's material status, fame, right? You generally bring your joy. What are you chasing? Second is whatever you're chasing, your dream is, the things you want to do, is not harm to others. You're not bring harm to others, right? And then the third is you're not doing something illegal. <laughs> of course, yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, and it's depending on where you are, and you know, because like in your case, you know, you, you're from China, you live in the US, you've been in many places, that can vary widely based on different places, rules and laws, et cetera. But yeah, generally Absolutely. speaking, I think most of us, it's relatively easy to avoid that, but there right. are people who inadvertently cross the line. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, it's not illegal, it's not bring harm to other people, respect others. And then last one is, you are not forced to do this, to do the things or the dreams. You're not forced to do something that you're going to do or forced into a position to chase something you're wanting to do, right? Um, so that's really, now my mom really have the mentality and then it's really passed on to me. It's like, this is the rules you should follow. But beyond, beyond to those rules, just go chase your dream. You know, in another, in, a, in another way, you could say it's like you need to have a framework, but one, but, yes. but outside of the framework, you should need to be flexible and don't just confine yourself to within it, but just absolutely don't break the don't break the key rules or don't you know don't go out, out of bounds in a, another way. And I think that's a that's a big problem with a lot of people, especially kids, when parents put on all these expectations or they tell you you need to do this, you need to do that. Yeah, you definitely. I think parents need to not force, I don't use the word force, but encourage their kids to be ambitious, to learn, to get, to gain, you know, all these good right. things, but not just because I say so, because you need, to, because I, I want you to be to find fulfillment for yourself. You know? Absolutely. I think that's, that's, there's, you can definitely tell, I think, you know, psychologically and within the person's, within a person's personality and mentality, which one of those which is which one is more dominant if it's more just yeah. pushing do this don't just do it do it versus okay you need to do stuff but you but find fulfillment for yourself absolutely and then i think overall for my life like one of my main goal is when i'm old you know when i'm old i'm laying on my desk but 
I do not want to ask myself, what if I did this? What if I done that? Would my life be different? You know, like that's the only thing I don't want to happen to me. So hence no regrets. You know, you don't want to absolutely you know, why why didn't I do that? Why how come I didn't try that? Or, you know, all the what ifs and regrets. That's and that's something I've talked to a lot of elderly and they say, hey, you know, things like, hey, take care of everybody. You're young now, but still take care of everybody because I'm regretting that now or this or that. Absolutely. So many things and just, you know, heed heed a lot of good advice because it, it will definitely pay off for you. Absolutely. I think for other people, including myself, career change is not, never easy. There's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of uncertainties. People say this is weird. People don't support. It can happen in many ways. However, if that makes you happy, that's your dream, go for it. Really well, just go for it. And I think that stems from a lot the fact that a lot of people don't do well with adaptation or change. You know, Absolutely. We, we, our lives are full of change, but people can, you know, you know, come into it or, you know, deal with it in different ways. Some more positive, some more negatively or healthily or, let, you know, not as, or more unhealthily. But, you know, I think that, and just from what, just from your, your life story so far and just what you've accomplished in your life, because, you know, let's face it, I think we're still, we're still pretty young, <laughs> but, you know, you, you're from China, you came here, you've, you've had, edu- you've been through the Chinese education system, the U.S. education system, you've been to college, undergrad, grad, mm-hmm. and then you've, you know, traveled, you've worked for, you know, two Fortune 500 companies, and now you're doing this in Antarctica, and now you're basically, now you're a certified flight instructor, just the just the variance of your, of what you've done and what you've accomplished, what, cert, what skills and abilities you have. I mean, that's very unique. I mean, not a Thank lot you. of people can say that. I think, I think it's a little bit, a little bit from my personality that when I want something, I really want to do it. And also really, you know, through my lifetime, whether it's career, whether it's later on meeting my boyfriend and he's pointing in the right direction, meeting my great friend Lily and all that stuff like I think I was really fortunate to have those people in my life and uh, always supported me and uh, always point me to a right direction you know work through the the hard times and you know so I think I think it's very unfortunate and then you know another thing I really want to mention is when you're doing a career change whether you want to chase your dreams sometimes it might sound really odd or sometimes sounds like really you know, not the norm, but don't be afraid of thinking yourself is the, the black sheep in the way. And as you travel or talking to other people, you will realize there are so many people just like you. And there are communities that can support each other. And then they understand exactly what, where you come from, what are you thinking are. And then there are people who really shows you the robe or, no, or tell you their life stories and how they overcome and you know is it's not uncommon no i think it goes comes back to this and this is a very important for people is that you travel you meet new people you do things what will make all that come to fruition and you'll gain the maximum amount of information and insight is by having an open mind and by always learning you, you, absolutely you demonstrate you always are learning something, you know, yep. you know, you, whether it's whatever, this and that, you're always learning, you're adapting or developing, you're trying to embed yourself, improve, your, improve yourself, and at the same time, help those around you, and at the same time, become a better person. I think that is a great archetype for people, because let's face it, the world we live in today, it's, it's very fast paced, it's ever changing, and, you know, a lot of people have a hard time dealing with that, you know, and yeah. it's understandably so, but I think, you know, you've been able to maximize the opportunities and, you know, experiences you've had. And, you know, who knows, you know, the next decade or so, I'm very eager to see what you'll be able to accomplish because, you know, you've already accomplished all of this and that's very impressive in and of itself. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So hopefully I can uh, keep going with what I'm doing and then, you know, hope to um inspire others to do the same no no all the power to you and you know keep going you know it's you know just hearing you it's very motivating for myself and you know just from my own experiences you know like this podcast for example this is one way i i'm trying to you know expand and develop 
you know, ideas about the world, people, places, and ideas, because I think in this day and age, we need, you know, things are becoming more interconnected, but we need even more. And at the end Absolutely. of the day, we're all people, we all have similar wants, interests, desires, and, and, you know, we all want to, we all have the same needs and we want the best for our families, our children, you know, for ourselves, et cetera. And that transcends countries, politics, ideologies, et cetera, at the end of the day, if you go down to the base and, you know, Absolutely. and, you know, and stories like you serve as, you know, inspiration for people. And I think a lot of people who maybe have, have lived a very great life, but a much more simple life in a way can gain a lot of interesting insight from, from the think from a story like yours. Absolutely. And I think, again, like, I think your broadcast is great. You're really connecting with different people from different places, their stories, their background, their culture. And, you know, for your listener, I'm sure they really benefit from it as well. Like, you know, broaden their horizon if they haven't had the opportunity to experience the rest of the world. You know, I think it's, it's great. Exactly. You know, just give them a window, give them, give them something. And I'm always open to new ideas and I love sharing people's stories. You know, and, you know, and that's, I think that's one thing that captures anyone is just, you know, people's stories, you know, that just grabs people's attention and, you know, they, why, of course they vary widely, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, people can always connect to someone's story or a type of story because they can find something of themselves in that. Absolutely. I a hundred percent agree to that. You know, well, I really appreciate you coming on today. I, you know, you have, like I said, a wonderful story, very interesting, you know, great. It's amazing what you've been able to accomplish. So, you know, in closing, you know, what would, what, what would you say would be your recommendations or tips for, for people to like, you know, to maximize, you know, life and, you know, what they can do? I say chase your dream, never give up your dream, no matter how hard to achieve your dream and don't be afraid don't be afraid to go for it. And then there are many of us out there doing the same thing. No, very well said. And that really falls in line with one of my favorite quotes by Alexander the Great, his fortune favors the bold. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to have you on for this episode. And, you know, I'm really, it's great to catch up with you again to see what you've been able to accomplish. And, you know, I would really enjoy hearing what you've been able to to do and all your experiences and I mean let's face it I mean Antarctica of all places how many people I don't know anyone else who's worked and traveled to Antarctica so that's pretty <laughs> awesome in and of itself so. yeah. yeah thank you so much for having me Sean I really I, I really appreciate it you gave me this opportunity to share my story to others you know thank you so much for having me here Oh, my pleasure. And, you know, I'd love to have you back on to, to discuss, you know, uh, other topics, other things you have, because like you said, you know, you're from China, you live in the U.S., you have a lot of areas that you can go into depth on based on your experiences. So, you know, I'd be happy to have you back. And I'm sure, you know, our listeners would love to hear more about what you have to offer. Sounds good. Absolutely. I'd love to do that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That's great to hear. So, well, everyone, I appreciate you tuning in for this episode. And as always, let's hope COVID continues to abate so we can get back out there, travel the world, learn, experience, and gain more experiences and insight about this wonderful world of ours and, you know, meet people like Annie here and uh, go on from there. So this has been another episode of International Immersion. Feel free to check us out at on our Facebook page, International Immersion, or our Instagram page of the same name. And feel free to contact us by sending an email to internationalimmersionpodcast.gmail.com. We'd love to hear about ideas, uh, stories, and we're always looking for new content to uh, focus on and produce. So until next time, this has been another episode, and we'll see you on the next one.